Great. I love this uh, back and forth that we can do with uh, with the Zoom without having to jump up on stage <laughs> and and all that. Um, great. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker uh, who you've already met, uh, Susan Buckbinder. Susan uh, is a professor uh, here at UCSF, but also a major player in the public health department here in San Francisco, where she's led a, a number of studies of, of, of various strategies, especially uh, of, of prophylaxis, pre-exposure pre prophylaxis now, uh, also has participated in the AMP studies that you just heard a little bit about. Um, and obviously the area of, of PrEP is a hugely important one, complex, changing quickly, and without taking any more of her time, uh, introduce Susan to, to take us through that. Great. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, so I am going to talk about uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and um, these are my financial relationships. Um, where uh, What I'm hoping that you'll be able to do by the end of this talk is to be able to safely start and stop PrEP, um, to counsel patients about 2-1-1 PrEP, and to be able to describe new PrEP modalities. So I've divided the talk into three sections. The first is the longest, and that's really talking about daily oral PrEP because that's really the standard of care at the moment. Um, we will talk about on-demand approaches, and then I'll end with a summary of some of these long-acting investigational drugs that you just heard about. So starting with uh, daily oral PrEP, we've had TDF-FTC PrEP uh, available since 2012. Um, there actually were data that were presented at the end of 2010 um, that showed that pre-exposure prophylaxis with TDF-FTC worked for men who have sex with men and transgender women in the um, IPREX study. And then shortly thereafter, there was data available from the partners prep study in serodiscordant heterosexual couples that showed the TDF-FTC also reduced, uh, pre it reduced HIV acquisition in that population. So in July of 2012, the US FDA gave a licensure indication for TDF-FTC for PrEP, um, and the World Health Organization came out with guidance on pre-exposure prophylaxis for serodiscordant couples, men and transgender women who have sex with men at high risk of HIV. So I have a question to start off with for you. How is it that you start PrEP? Do you wait for lab results? Do you start PrEP immediately, meaning same day? Do you, uh, have you not prescribed PrEP or something else? Go ahead and answer. Okay. So we have 41% uh, of you wait for lab results, and another 35% actually do same-day start. So that's great. Let's talk a little bit about same-day starts. Um, these are data from that were presented a couple of years ago from the New York City Sexual Health Clinics, in which they took uh, over 1,400 PrEP candidates, and they asked them three simple questions. Do you have a history of kidney disease? Do you have a history of hepatitis B infection? Uh, with chronic infection, and do you have any acute signs or symptoms of HIV infection? 97% of them said no to all three questions, and so they were, um, they were uh, moved into the immediate PrEP arm, and only 3% or 50 of the people said yes to any of the questions, and so they were deferred to a deferred PrEP arm. And here's what actually happened. When they had labs drawn then on the individuals, um, there were only four people in the immediate PrEP arm who uh, had to stop PrEP, two because they had a GFR of less than 60 and two because they were actually HIV positive. Um, so nine, over 99% were able to continue PrEP uh, having had started at the same day. Whereas in the delayed PrEP arm, they had seven people or 14% of that group actually had a contraindication to starting uh, TDF-FTC PrEP, either because of a GFR of less than 60, um, because they were NAP positive, or um, they wanted to know that they had uh, hepatitis B uh, surface antigen positivity. And uh, so 14% um, were not started on PrEP, but an additional 80, but 86% who were left were actually eligible for PrEP. However, only 35% of those people who were eligible for PrEP actually returned to start on PrEP. So there is something to be said about a bird in the hand um, and that you can start same-day PrEP safely uh, as long as you have close follow-up, you, you get the laboratory um, test drawn on that day, and that you've got very close follow-up so that you can stop PrEP if there is an absolute contraindication to PrEP. 
So now let's talk about for whom does TDF-FTC prep work? And if you see on the right, there are men who have sex with men and transgender women. And if you look at the placebo arm versus the prep arm in that, uh, in that group, then uh, they had a substantial reduction in new infections. The same thing for people who inject drugs, also a, a substantial reduction in the risk of infection. And for serodiscordant couples, a substantial redu- reduction um, in the RCTs. But when you looked at the subsample who were actually highly adherent to PrEP, you saw almost no infections. And so we know that PrEP is really highly effective as long as it's taken on a regular basis. Um, And we'll talk a little bit about what a regular basis means in just a moment. But it's currently approved, TDF-FTC PrEP is approved for everyone who is at risk of either sexually or injection-acquired HIV um, as long as they're 35 kilograms uh, or greater. So there's no absolute age cutoff. So let's talk about starting and stopping PrEP. And this is, uh, as Turner mentioned, a little bit controversial. Um, for men who have sex with men, the, the uh, growing consensus is that seven days before is adequate or actually just having a loading dose with a double dose of TDF-FTC PrEP. And we'll talk about that in a, in a few moments, but that's really the basis of the 211 PrEP or on-demand PrEP. For women, the CDC currently recommends 20 days uh, before because that's the time that it takes to get to a maximum level of, uh, of TDF-FTC in the blood. But the, there's a growing consensus that seven days uh, pre-exposure may be adequate to get to high enough levels in the mucosal um, tissue to uh, be able to prevent HIV acquisition. In terms of maintenance, women are supposed to be taking six to seven doses a week, and that's because the PK suggests that the level of concentration of PrEP, of TDF-FTC PrEP, is about um, a hundredfold lower in the vaginal tissue than it is in the rectal tissue, Um, whereas men who have sex with men may be able to, from modeling studies, get away with just four doses a week, and that it looks like four doses a week is approximately equal to seven doses a week in terms of maximizing protection. I will say that there are data from some um, demonstration projects that suggest that women may get high levels of adher- high levels of protection even with lower levels of adherence. But still, the, the recommendation generally um, when we're counseling our female patients is to say, this is a pill that you really need to take every day. Whereas with men who have sex with men, you might say, you know, it's good to try to take it every day, but if you miss a dose here or there, it's really not going to be a problem. In terms of stopping PrEP, um, the CDC recommends 28 days to stop PrEP. But again, I think that there are increase, there's increasing evidence that for men who have sex with men, you may only need two days after the last sexual act. And again, that comes from this two-on-one PrEP that we'll describe in a moment um, that is... Uh, that only two days after the last sexual act may be sufficient to be able to provide uh, adequate protection, and that for women, likely seven days uh, post-exposure is sufficient. So again, for men, it's either a double dose or seven days before and two days after, and for women, it's probably seven days before and seven days after. And that's more tenable than telling women that they need to start taking Uh, prep 20 days before and maintain it for 28 days after their sexual exposure. So let's talk a little bit about transgender women because there are a number of transgender individuals, uh, women and men, who are concerned that tenofovir-based regimens may interfere with their their gender-affirming hormones. So this is a data, uh, this is a study from Bob Grant in which They took 24 HIV-negative trans men and 24 HIV-negative trans women and gave them directly observed therapy uh, who who were actually on gender-affirming hormones, I should mention. Um, So the trans men were taking testosterone, the trans women were taking estradiol, and they were put on to four weeks of directly observed uh, therapy with oral daily TDF-FTC. And then they measured both the concentrations of uh, TDF-FTC as well as hormones in the blood. And here are the results for the hormone levels. You can see the plasma estradiol before and after PrEP on the left, the plasma testosterone on the right, and we've got the transgender men and the transgender women in each of these categories. And what you can see is that before baseline is um, blue, uh, red is the four-week data, 
you can see that there's essentially no change at all in gender affirming hormone levels with uh, TDFFTC. So that's really important information that we can share with our transgender patients, many of whom really have been concerned about starting PrEP because of concerns about what it would do to their gender affirming hormones. The other question is what are the gender affirming hormones do to tenofovir uh, uh, diphosphate concentrations in dried blood spots? after four weeks of directly observed daily therapy. So is the, are we seeing subtherapeutic levels? And what you can see from this study is that the levels were uh, very, comp- very similar across the different populations. Now, there are data that were published from transgender women on estradiol that suggested that the active metabolite in rectal tissue was substantially lower for women on estradiol and that it was directly uh, related to the level of estradiol in the blood. And so for that reason, we're still a little bit more cautious with transgender women, suggesting that they, like cisgender women, um, should follow the same sort of regulation about uh, uh, daily prep rather than, than four times a week prep. So one of the questions that arises is what do you do for people who may have some uh, concerns about renal insufficiency? Um, there are multiple studies now that suggest that you might drop your uh, estimated GFR to less than 70 milliliters per minute. If you start off with a lower GFR to begin with of less than 90, if you're somewhat older, um, I say somewhat older, a little tongue-in-cheek, just over 40 to 50 years of age in some of these uh, studies, um, if you have a lower weight or higher adherence. But I will say that the creatinine bump that was seen in these studies is often unconfirmed on repeat testing. So that can be the first thing that you do to be sure that you um, to, to be sure that you don't have toxicity from TDF-FTC. Uh, creatinine reverts to near baseline levels after the trial and rechallenge has been used successfully. Nonetheless, um, there was this question about could you use TAF-FTC instead of TDF-FTC for pre-exposure prophylaxis? And so this is data from the DISCOVER trial that Turner also mentioned briefly. Um, men who have sex with men and transgender women were enrolled in this study and randomly assigned one-to-one to either get FTAF or FTDF. Now, unlike the cabotegravir uh, study that had um, 50% uh, black participants in the U.S., this study only had 9% black participants in the U.S., and unlike the the cabotegravir study that had 12% transgender people. This had only about 1% transgender women. Nonetheless, we did get data from this study. It may not be quite as reflective of the overall population that we are trying to reach with these studies, with these uh, agents, but it did suggest that uh, FTAF was non-inferior to FTDF for protection. It was not superior, but it was non-inferior, so no worse than FTDF. So what do you do in a situation where you've got two agents that may be effective? Well, um, you want to look at what the uh, differences were in safety at 96 weeks. And what was remarkable was that the differences in safety were really very minimal. So the bone mineral density and renal function favored the FTAF arm. But in terms of bone mineral density, there was just a 1% to 2% difference in bone mineral density at the spine and the hip, and no difference in the rate of fractures um, between the two arms. So a fairly minimal reduction in bone mineral density. In terms of renal function, there was just a 4 milliliter per minute difference in the estimated GFR at 96 weeks. So while you still may want to go with FTAF in people for certainly who start off with uh, renal insufficiency, um, and even perhaps people who are at risk for renal insufficiency, there were really fairly minor differences between the two. And the uh, the things that favored FTDF over FTAF were lipids and body weight, but again, fairly minimal differences, an 11 milligram per deciliter lower total cholesterol and no difference in the total cholesterol to HDL ratio, and only a one kilogram difference in body weight. So we're not seeing the, the huge differences that have been seen in some of the treatment trials in terms of body weight with uh, TAF-FTC. So this is an infographic that my colleague uh, Julia Marcus put together that can be useful in talking through patients about the um, the relative pros and cons of TDF-FTC versus TAF-FTC. You can see that there's a difference in the pill size. Um, 
only TDF FTC has been uh, tested in heterosexuals and people who inject drugs and is highly effective in both those populations, whereas both drugs are highly effective for men who have sex with men and transgender women. And the TAF FTC does not have a current license indication for people who are um, having receptive vaginal sex. So it really is not supposed to be used in women who engage in receptive vaginal sex. Uh, again, the differences in GFR and bone mineral density are fairly minor, but support uh, TAF FTC um, for those two toxicities. For LDL and body weight, again, just a very slight preference for TDF FTC. And right now, probably the biggest difference is that uh, TDF FTC just went generic in 2020. So some health departments and some clinics are suggesting that TDF FTC is the universal uh, PrEP agent and that TAF FTC be reserved for those people who um, can't use it or have a strong preference for uh, getting uh, that drug over TDF FTC. So we have these two highly effective uh, pre-exposure prophylactic, prophylactic agents, and we have this Ending the Epidemic National Initiative that's goal is to get to a 75% reduction in new HIV infections in five years and at least a 90% reduction in 10 years. And one of the four pillars for achieving that is to prevent new transmissions by using proven interventions, including PrEP. Um, and so PrEP is really one of the cornerstones of this Ending the Epidemic um, initiative. So how well are we doing so far? Well, we're not doing nearly well enough. The goal would be um, there are uh, it's estimated 1.2 million Americans who may benefit from pre-exposure prophylaxis. And in terms of PrEP starts, where um, as of 2018, we were only 18% of the way there, doing better in men and much worse in women. We're doing better in the mi middle age ranges and much less well in the youngest age group, as well as in the oldest age group. But the youngest age group that may be at really substantially elevated risk, only 11.4% uh, were covered with PrEP. Here's what's very disturbing. Um, we see that there are these substantial racial and ethnic disparities. 42% uh, of white individuals who are recommended PrEP uh, have, uh, have started on PrEP whereas it's much lower, 6% for uh, Black or African Americans and for Latinx, uh, 11%. And so we really need to find ways to um, make PrEP both uh, desirable and, uh, and increase the uptake and make it accessible for uh, people of color, in particular African Americans and Latinx uh, communities. And then if you look at the geographic distribution, the darker colors here show lower levels of coverage. And we know that uh, over half of the new infections in the United States are occurring in the southeastern United States. And that's where um, rates of PrEP uptake are substantially lower, uh, particularly as there has not been medical, uh, Medicaid expansion in some of those areas. So... Um, it's not just about taking up PrEP, but it's also about staying on PrEP. So this is about PrEP persistence in a national sample. The blue lines show the people who had initiated PrEP. So that's the 100%. And then they looked at um, what about persistence at just one year in orange bars and at two years in the gray bars. And you can see that there are these dramatic declines across all age ranges, but particularly with the younger age populations. Persistence has been um, very low. And if you look at that for um, women versus men, you can see again that we're doing less well with women with uh, much less persistence, only about a third of women persisting on PrEP um, at one year. We also know that COVID has interrupted PrEP uh, uptake and PrEP uh, both PrEP new starts, this is, these are data from the Fenway Community Health Center, PrEP new starts were down 72%, and PrEP refills were lapsing, and uh, that increased by 191% from January to April of last year. So what we've seen, and this is, these are data from the Magnet Sexual Health Clinic in San Francisco, the orange line are the PrEP uh, prescriptions, and you can see again this uh, cliff uh, that people dropped off of when we started with um, with the COVID pandemic. Now, what we've been seeing is some reversion back to higher levels, but still not at the levels that we saw prior to the COVID pandemic. And so we do need to find ways to get PrEP to individuals, despite um, 
COVID when clinics are closed or people are not wanting to come into clinics. So let's talk more broadly about the top reasons why people who may benefit from PrEP don't take or stop PrEP. And um, I divide these into five different buckets of reasons. One is about sexual risk. One is about access issues, concerns about medications, stigma, and interfering life events. For some of these, there's going to be a consistent problem regardless of the type of PrEP that's used, regardless of whether it's daily PrEP or on-demand PrEP, uh, an oral pill or an injectable. And that's true, for instance, if you've got low self-perceived risk, you may not want to take PrEP. If you don't have providers or there are cost or insurance barriers, that may affect all different kinds of PrEP modalities. Um, medical mistrust may be a problem uh, regardless of the type of PrEP that, uh, that you may have access to. And concerns about being labeled as high risk and stigma are not going to be addressed just by having a different method of, of PrEP available necessarily. And life events, again, can interfere in either situation. But there are some problems that could be alleviated by different PrEP modalities. So, for instance, if you have infrequent sexual contact, using uh, an on-demand regimen may be more appealing. If you have difficulty adhering to the visitor lab schedule, then some of these longer acting agents that require less frequent um, visits or less frequent lab schedules may be desirable. Um, there may be concerns about specific side effects with either TDF uh, FTC or TAF FTC, or you may just not want to take a daily pill, in which case having a uh, an on-demand pill or an injectable might or an implantable or one of the other agents may, may seem uh, more desirable. And there are privacy concerns um, that people have that can sometimes be alleviated depending on what the uh, different PrEP modality is. So let's talk then next about on-demand approaches to PrEP. And I want to start by just reminding us about PEP or post-exposure prophylaxis because it's really underutilized. So these were data that came from 10 of the U.S. cities with the greatest overall HIV prevalence. And you can see that um, if you compare HIV providers to non-HIV providers, 82% um, of the non-HIV providers were aware of post-exposure prophylaxis, but that means 18% were not aware, so nearly one in five um, this is now decades post uh, the recommendations for non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. And if you look at whether or not PrEP, PEP has been prescribed by individuals, only about two-thirds of the HIV providers and fewer than a quarter of the non-HIV providers have actually provided PEP. So it does just remind us that we should counsel our patients that if they do have an unexpected um, exposure to HIV, that they can take post-exposure prophylaxis, particularly if they, the earlier the better after exposure, but up to 72 hours after the exposure, they can still uh, um, take post-exposure prophylaxis. So the other on-demand regimen that has received a lot of attention is the Ipergay regimen, which is also sometimes called 211. And it's called 211 because you take two pills or a loading dose two to 24 hours before sex, one tablet 24 hours after that, and another tablet 24 hours after that. So it's 2-1-1, but it could also be called 2-1-1-1-1 uh, because you just, if you have uh, more sexual activity, then you just take daily pills until four, 48 hours after the last sexual exposure. And if you've stopped and you're getting ready to restart, if the last pill was taken within seven days, then you don't need a loading dose. You only need a single pill to start. So it's a little bit complex to describe, but it, that's why we use the term 211 so that they remember it's two pills, two to 24 hours before, one pill, 24 hours each after that. And then you continue taking pills until 48 hours after your last sexual episode. And again, uh, if, you, if you restart, you don't need the loading dose unless it's been at least seven days since you took your last uh, dose. So how well did this do? Well, in the randomized control trial, there was 86% efficacy against a placebo control. And in the uh, open label extension, a 97% relative reduction versus placebo um, in the uh, risk of HIV acquisition. 
The issue is that these were individuals who were still having relatively frequent sex. And so if you have, if you're having sex once a week, then you're taking four pills around that time. So that's, um, four pills a week, which I've said is essentially equivalent to taking seven pills a week for men who have sex with men. And on average, these, the men involved in this study were taking 18 pills a month. So a little more than four pills a week. So the question arises, is it effective if you ta- if you have sex less frequently than that? And so there was an analysis of the hypergay study looking at people with less frequent sex. And what you can see is that there were no infections in the TDF-FTC arm um, of people who were not taking, uh, who were, uh, who had less frequent sex, but were taking TDF-FTC, whereas there were six infections in the placebo, a 9% incidence rate. Um, and so really a substantial reduction. So it does work even if you're taking PrEP very intermittently because you've got much less frequent sexual activity. So if you do a head-to-head comparison of 2-1-1 PrEP against daily PrEP, who can use it? Well, 2-1-1 PrEP has only been studied in men who have sex with men, so it's only currently recommended in that population, whereas daily PrEP can be used by anyone. TDF-FTC is the only drug that's been tested in 2-1-1 PrEP, so you don't want to use it with TAF-FTC, but daily can be either TDF-FTC or TAF-FTC. Chronic hepatitis B infection um, can trigger a flare um, where if you use 2-1-1 PrEP, you need to plan at least two hours in advance, and it's not forgiving of missed doses. So 2-1-1 PrEP has um, been endorsed by the WHO, not yet by the CDC, but it will be hopefully in the near future. Um, and then there is tenofovir douches um, that are being currently evaluated as another on-demand uh, Um, method. You can see here that you can get quite high levels in the colonic cells, higher than daily oral PrEP or less frequent uh, than daily oral PrEP. And you can see that in this non-human primate challenge study, it did even better than oral daily PrEP. So I'm just going to close by briefly mentioning the long-acting agents that you've already heard about. Cabotegravir is superior to TDF-FTC for women and men. It's currently being uh, used as an IM injection formulation, but it's being considered for an implant and a microarray patch. There are questions about why there were breakthrough infections in the trial. Will the tail provide long-lasting protection, or will it be too low and actually then for protection but select for resistance? By whom will this be used? Who's going to want this? And how, where, and by whom will it be administered? And we talked a little bit about that in the last talk. Is Lactrevir, this, non, this nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, is being evaluated as a monthly pill for men who have sex with men and transgender women in a, an efficacy study, and it will also be studied in cisgender women in, in a separate efficacy study. It's going to be evaluated as a yearly implant as well in the future, and it could be possibly combined with contraception. Lenacapavir is a capsid inhibitor that's being evaluated as a semi-annual subcutaneous injection for men who have sex with men and transgender persons in one study, and in cisgender women in a separate study that's also got an arm that's going to look at TAF-FTC so that we'll finally get an answer as to whether or not TAF-FTC is protective for cisgender women. And then I just want to close by mentioning depivirine vaginal rings. Um, This is an NNRTI that was found to have approximately 30% efficacy in RCTs and approximately 50% efficacy in open-label extension studies. It's recently been improved by the European Medicine Agency, um, as well as endorsed by the WHO. Um, And next-generation products may allow for less than monthly, but sort of quarterly uh, vaginal ring insertion, as well as combinations with contraception. And so in conclusion, we really have highly effective PrEP and PEP options with more under development. And I didn't even talk about some of the PEP options that are currently under development. Um, Cabotegravir long-acting uh, intramuscular is the latest product, but we have a robust pipeline of monthly pills, semi-annual subcutaneous injections, annual implants, and possibly vaginal rings. There are challenges with uptake and persistence in all populations, but particularly for youth, people of color, women, and people who inject drugs. And long-acting agents will solve some, but not all of these problems associated with daily pills. But we need to offer choice and provide support tools to keep people on PrEP during periods of risk. Thanks so much, and I'm happy to take questions. 
Great, Susan. Thank you very much. Uh, great, uh, great review. Um, and we have a number of questions that are coming in. Remember to use the Q and A uh, function. Um, before I start uh, taking uh, questions from the audience, I'm just curious myself. Um, San Francisco has made a big effort uh, called Getting to Zero, uh, a multi-pronged effort to to reduce transmission and and death from HIV. What's happened with that uh, campaign with COVID is uh, looks as though some aspects of it are in trouble. It's true. We've actually seen a we saw a really dramatic decline both in uh, prep uptake and as well as in uh, testing HIV testing right. and as well as in viral load um, uh, monitoring. Um, we have seen a rebound back towards normal, but not. It's still about ten percent lower levels of HIV testing and. Uh, and viral load testing than what we saw before. So people are trying to find other ways around delivery of PrEP to uh, people's homes um, and finding other ways to, to be doing monitoring and uh, clinic visits for patients um, in the time of COVID. Right. And, and you know, we've all seen um, a dramatic increase in, in new strategies of patient contact, whether it's telephone or video visits. Right. Um, and there are questions uh, really on the implementation side. You, you know, I mean, the, the recommendation is they come in every three months in person, lab, et cetera. Is that realistic, and what are people doing uh, in terms of um, of changing that kind of follow up now that we have the concerns with COVID? Yeah, so there are different ways, different strategies for trying to address that um, with uh, home prescription deliveries and home HIV testing. Um, there is a, a program called Take Me Home that you can look up online. Um, it's working with health departments around the country to do be able to do home testing of HIV and uh, even creatinine levels and uh, home screening for STIs. So that, I think, is going to become a more uh, desirable uh, approach in the future. Great, great. Um, so a um, question about uh, where is a good information source? Um, black and Latinx men who do not identify as MSM uh, report only female uh, sex partners. Uh, is there... Is there a good source for PrEP information for those uh, uh, for those people? That's a great uh, question. I, you know, I um, there are lots of places to get good at information about PrEP, and I think um, uh, the AVAC, the AIDS Vaccine Advocacy Coalition, there's a PrEP tracker, and a, there's a lot of PrEP information on that website. It's not specifically targeted towards. Um, uh, African American uh, men who have sex with men, or Latinx men who have sex with men, or people who are not necessarily identifying as um, men who have sex with men or gay. Um, and so, I think that what what you need to look at is within, um, hopefully, within your own cities. We're tr- we've tried to launch different kinds of uh, campaigns about prep for different populations and. Uh, and so look, just looking to see what other cities have online that may be available to people um, is, is one approach. So another a really great question is um, respond to concern that uh, low prep uptake is just that we're not doing a very good job of creating an L- LGBT kind of friendly environment in our healthcare system. Prep is only one aspect of what that complex community set of communities needs um is is that a is that something you're thinking about i think that's absolutely the case um it really is and and i think that one of the things that we can all do with our patients just in, so i think that we need more lgbtqi friendly uh services for our patients but also we need to be offering prep we need to not forget about women um, who may benefit from prep and so one of the approaches that some people are using is to just educate all of their patients about prep to say you know we have actually a daily pill that can prevent hiv infection is that something you'd like to hear a little bit more about for people who may potentially be exposed to hiv and then um, it gives you an entree without necessarily having to identify somebody as f- falling into um, some preordained uh, category that uh, that indicates that they may benefit from PrEP. Um, and then uh, uh, quickly, um, real-world data on why people choose uh, 211 versus daily PrEP, um, is that... Yeah, you know, in fact, in the time of COVID, a lot of people have, got, have actually converted 
from daily prep to two-on-one prep, but people go back and forth between the two. And I think in general, people go to two-on-one prep when they're having less frequent sexual activity, as long as they can plan two hours in advance. And so people will be very uh, creative and, for instance, uh, pop a pill first and then wait two hours before they go online to find it to on a hookup site to find a, 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 a partner or they may uh, open a bottle of wine first and spend a little time beforehand. I've heard all kinds of uh, strategies that people use, but I think it's really for people who can plan ahead and people who are having less frequent sexual activity. Have STI rates changed uh, after the pandemic uh, hit us? Unfortunately, we've seen, uh, we, we know that STI testing went down for a while. Um, unfortunately, we've seen still high rates of STIs despite uh, COVID. And I think, um, there was an initial decline, probably uh, as you know, people were people sheltered, sheltered in place. place yeah, more. yeah. Um, but then uh, that only lasts for so long, and so there's a real concern that if we're delivering fewer services and doing less STI screening, that we might have more untreated Got STIs it. out there. Well, thank you very much, Susan. That was a that was a brilliant talk. Several people commented uh, on how great your talk was. So thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, we now go to. A break. Uh, what we found is that uh, when we're trying to do, you know, several hours of Zoom, people do want to kind of get up and stretch, and they should. It's healthy. So we'll take a 30-minute break um, and just hang in there, and we'll let you know when we're going to start. Um, thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs> 